Hi everyone, welcome back to Neurobiology at Providence College. I'm Joe DeGeorgis. Today we're going to talk about a second paper by John Heuser and his colleagues. The title is Synaptic Vesicle Exocytosis Captured by Quick Freezing and Correlated with Quantal Transmitter Release. It was published in the Journal of Cell Biology in 1979. Again, he is looking at the frog neuromuscular junction, and at the time, we knew that presynaptic terminals were filled with these small synaptic vesicles. And it was theorized, as we've talked about before, that the synaptic vesicles fuse with this cell membrane and release neurotransmitter to the downstream cell, in this case, muscle at the neuromuscular junction. Biochemically, people had isolated synaptic vesicles and shown that they contain a high level of neurotransmitter, but no one had ever seen a synaptic vesicle actually fuse with the membrane, that is to say, fuse with the cell membrane. It was known by the rate of synaptic transmission that the effusion event must happen in millisecond time scale. And it was likely that if you tried to dissect out the neuromuscular junction and then set it into fixative, that is by immersion, that it would be unlikely to capture this event because the fixation process is simply too slow. So Heuser and colleagues decided to build a high high speed. So Heuser and colleagues decided to build a high speed freezing machine to quick freeze the neuromuscular junction and capture vesicles in the process of fusing with the cell membrane. Heuser's freezing machine was a really cool device. In the base, they had liquid helium, which is extremely cold. And the liquid was in contact with a copper block. So the copper was extremely cold. And then they had a shutter here, a door, so that they could pull a vacuum on the system and they could keep frost from building up on the surface of the copper block. So this was under high vacuum. Then they have this rod that has some pulleys, kind of a track, like this, and they had a fancy device to hold the neuromuscular junction on the base of this rod, and we'll talk about that in a moment. This is figure one of the paper here. And they would put the neuromuscular junction dissected onto the tip of this rod, and then they would put an electrode into the presynaptic terminal of the nerve cell, and they would fire the neuron, vent this chamber, that is, let air into the chamber, open the door, and then jam the sample against this metal copper block so that, that the sample would freeze on contact. That's the quick freeze method developed by Heuser and colleagues in this publication. They invented this. It's kind of an erector set type of freezing machine. They had it built, and then they used this to stop the vesicles in the process of fusing with the cell membrane. So once again, you have your sample here held on to this metal rod. They stimulate the presynaptic terminal to cause synaptic transmission, that is synaptic vesicle fusion and neurotransmitter release, if indeed that's how the phenomena occurs. And then they vent this chamber and they slam the piece of tissue against this very cold copper block to freeze the sample and stop physiological activity in its tracks, the vesicles fusing with the membrane. If you look at figure two, Heuser shows you a schematic of the sample holder. That is this part right here, but they draw it 
in the other direction, right side up. Like this is the rod here, and then the sample is here in this direction. So they flip the drawing over to show you the setup. So if you look at figure two, they show you the metal rod like this. And John used a piece of aluminum, John Heuser, a little thin strip of aluminum, and they hold that to this metal rod with double stick tape. You just put a little piece of tape here and then put this aluminum disc on there. And then they have a ring. And I'll get to the ring in a moment. So there's a plastic ring like this, a little donut. And I'm going to I'm going to ignore that for the time being. And then they put a piece of filter paper onto this aluminum disc. So it's just Wattman filter paper. In fact, they take a a hole punch for a three ring binder and you just punch out discs of Wattman filter paper and they super glue that onto the surface of this piece of aluminum. So you have double stick tape holding onto this disc of metal and then you have super glue holding on to this piece of filter paper. And then Hoiser says that they have this piece of liver and it's sort of confusing because what does liver have to do with this experiment? Well, it, it just serves as a shock absorber for the freezing event and I'll, I'll explain that in a little bit more detail. But the liver is just kind of a spongy material, and I don't know why John chose to use the liver. I've used a more modern version of this machine uh, that, that John helped design. This machine here uh, was in Tom Reese's lab uh, in Woods Hole for many years. It's now down at the National Institutes of Health where Tom is in the wintertime. Uh, but anyway, John uh, developed newer versions of this system and I just took a petri dish and I poured auger the same stuff that you use to to run DNA and RNA gels it's like a jello and I pour a thin layer in there and let it solidify and then cut out a little piece of auger so instead of using liver I used a little piece of auger but John's the master and he liked to use liver uh, and then the guys put on a sample, the neuromuscular junction, the team that is, um, and they put in an electrode into the presynaptic terminal so that they could stimulate the neuron and cause synaptic transmission. When they stimulated the neuron, the chamber would be vented and the sample would be jammed to the surface of the very cold copper block and freeze instantaneously, I mean it very quickly. The ring was used to stop the sample from being totally squashed when you slam it against the copper block. So the ring went around this sample, so you had the edge of the ring would be something like this and this, it's sort of hard to draw this schematically, but the ring would stop the sample from totally getting squashed when it made contact with the copper block. So I'm drawing this obviously with the sample facing up and the copper block facing down just for the sake of the schematic. But when you jam the sample into this copper block, it would be stopped by these edges of the plastic ring. So it didn't totally squash this thing totally flat. It would get squashed a little bit so that it was totally even with these two pieces of plastic, but the impact would be absorbed in part by this piece of liver that John put in there as kind of a sponge or a shock absorber. So they would stimulate the neuron, open, vent this chamber and open the door, and then slam this piece of tissue against this copper block. So this is a really cool machine designed by John Heuser, Tom Reese and their colleagues who wrote this paper, and we'll get to the results of their publication in a moment. But I had an opportunity to use a slightly more modern version, the version 2.0, when I was a postdoc 
with Tom Reese, and Tom and I did a bunch of experiments together with this machine, and it's actually just down the hall from me where I'm sitting now. I'm at the Marine Biological Laboratory today where I have a lab, and uh, Tom has a lab here too, which is uh, just down the hall. Okay, let's continue with the paper. In the results section of the publication, there's a title that states the physiological effects of 4AP, and they say, some of us knew from previous work that neurotransmitter release at neuromuscular junctions in Drosophila larvae was subsequently enhanced by 4-AP. And so we got together to try it on frog. This is one of my favorite lines of any publication because it certainly sounds fun. In figure three, they take one of their neuromuscular junctions. So you have a presynaptic terminal and you have a muscle fiber, the neuromuscular junction. Of course, the presynaptic terminal is loaded with synaptic vesicles that are filled with neurotransmitter. And they poison this system with curare. And curare is derived from plants. Indigenous people use the poison to hunt. It's a poison dart. They dip the dart into the curare and then they use the dart to hunt. And the curare binds to the receptors that are stimulated by the neurotransmitter, in this case, acetylcholine. So these are acetylcholine receptors, which we'll get to later in the course. And the curare binds to these receptors so that when the neurotransmitter is released, it outcompetes the transmitter for these receptor sites and the muscle won't contract. So when people use this to hunt, the animal would die because their diaphragm wouldn't work anymore and they'd die of asphyxiation. So now, if you put an electrode into muscle, you can record neurotransmission in the muscle as well. And they have a graph in figure three, and they say that if you poison the cell with curare, then you don't get a recording. It's this flat, I mean, you see a tiny little blip here, but it's flat. So they fire this presynaptic terminal in the presence of curare, and then they measure neurotransmission with this electrode that's in the muscle fiber, and it's just totally flat. Then they add 4-AP, so this chemical that they knew from other studies causes an increase in the number of synaptic vesicles that fuse with the cell membrane at stimulation. And they redo the experiment, and now they get this big spike like this. So there's so much acetylcholine, so much neurotransmitter being dumped into the synaptic cleft that it now can outcompete the curare and cause the muscle to contract. Okay, I have to redraw this because my computer froze and I lost the original drawing. So we have our presynaptic terminal with synaptic vesicles that we know are loaded with neurotransmitter. We have a muscle fiber because we're looking at the neuromuscular junction, that is Hoiser and his colleagues are looking at this connection and they can use an electrode here to record whether neurotransmission has occurred and they want to characterize a substance called 4-AP which they knew from previous work increased the amount of neurotransmitter released by the neuron when an action potential is fired. So they add curare, which is a toxin, curare, derived from plants, and it binds to receptors that usually receive the signal from the neurotransmitter. That is, the neurotransmitter binds to these receptors, and that causes the muscle fiber to contract. But curare binds to these receptors, and it competes with the neurotransmitter, which is acetylcholine in this particular case. And if you record now, if you add curare and you fire this nerve cell, then the muscle fiber doesn't contract and you get 
just a little blip right here, but essentially no recording at all with Curare because Curare is out competing the acetylcholine at the acetylcholine receptor. But now if you add 4AP, all of a sudden you get a really big spike like this. And that's because there's so much neurotransmitter now being released from the upstream neuron that the 4AP can outcompete the curare and cause this muscle fiber to contract. This was figure three of the paper. Now, if you repeat the experiment, but you leave out the curare, so you're just adding 4AP to the system and then firing this nerve cell with this stimulating electrode, then you get a huge recording in the terminal like this, and it kind of trickles down in this manner. And so two things happen. First of all, the height of this is increased by 4AP, but also the duration of the response increases too. So what that means is more neurotransmitters being released, presumably from the synaptic vesicles, that is a higher burst and over a longer period of time. So 4AP has greatly increased the number of events, the number of synaptic vesicle fusions happening at one stimulation. So this is figure three of the paper and this is figure four. And their finding is very important for the success of the project. So they show here that this scale bar is 20 milliseconds. And in this figure, this amount is only five milliseconds. So again, there are two major findings. One is that there's more neurotransmitter released. This is a higher amplitude than a normal firing. And there's neurotransmitter being released over a greater period of time. This is important for their experiment because what they're trying to do is visualize the vesicle fusing with the membrane, which has never been viewed before. And so by increasing the number of events and the length of time over which vesicles are fusing, they have a greater opportunity to capture that event by freezing it as this neuron's being stimulated. So they soak the neuromuscular junction in 4AP. They put it onto their really cool machine, the quick freeze machine. They stimulate the neuron and then they slam the piece of tissue against this very cold copper block and capture the phenomena of the vesicle fusing with the membrane, or at least that's the hope. So the experiment is a tiny bit more complicated. After they have their neuron, the, the synaptic terminal here, with the synaptic vesicles, and the muscle fiber, the neuromuscular junction. They again are stimulating this neuron in the presence of 4AP, which increases both the number of vesicles that fuse, or that's the theory, and the duration over what, whether they fuse. And they do that by measuring the output of the muscle, and that's a, that's a function of how much neurotransmitter is being released. So if there's a lot of neurotransmitter being released, that suggests that there's more vesicles fusing with the membrane. So they stimulate within the presence of 4AP and over this time period where they think the vesicles are fusing, they slam it against the frozen block and it freezes and, and stops its motion stops at that point, physically stops because of the freezing event. Now, they then take this frozen sample and they put it into a freeze fracture machine, which has a piece of metal that again is kept cold by 
liquid, probably nitrogen in this particular case. I mean, when I've done it, I've used liquid nitrogen. Uh, they could also use liquid helium, but both are extremely cold. And now you have your nerve terminal, which is glued to the device. The piece of aluminum is here attached to this. So you have the piece of aluminum um, with the, the liver is under there and all of that. And then you have your muscle fiber like this. But the whole system is frozen. And it's kept frozen in the machine because this piece of metal is extremely cold and it conducts the cold temperature to the sample. So the sample is frozen still at that point when neurotransmitter was being released and presumably the vesicles were fusing with the membrane. Now what they want to do is fracture the sample. And it's a little complicated, but there's a knife. It's a, it's a fancy razor blade and it doesn't actually cut it swings down and it hits the sample and the sample fractures. Now, if you have a set of cells, let's say that they're fertilized uh, frog eggs, something like that. There's a lipid bilayer, right? And we're going to draw three eggs and we freeze the eggs with the free slam technique just like with the neuron. And now these are frozen and you put them on the stage like this. And the, the razor blade hits the cells and the knife is cold, the sample is frozen, and when the blade hits, it just cracks this frozen material. It doesn't cut it, I mean it's a sharp edge, but it just cracks it because the whole thing is frozen. And there's a possibility that this cell just cracks in half like this. So it's a cross section through the sample. But more times than not, the crack happens in between the two layers of the lipid bilayer because this is lipid material and this is aqueous. I mean the cytoplasm has water in it. In here there's no water. It's all lipid. So the difference is, is similar to cutting an ice cube versus cutting a stick of butter. So it's much easier to cut the butter than the water. So if you made a butter sandwich and then you took the sandwich and you soaked it in a bucket of water and pulled it out and stuck it in the freezer and now you're trying to get the you're trying to break the sandwich in half most likely it's going to break in the middle where the butter is rather than within the bread that's soaked with water so there's two possibilities here you could crack this so that the crack goes up and over the top of the egg so now when you look at it, you have, this is the inside bilayer, and this is the outside bilayer, but you've cracked this top off, okay? Or it could crack in this fashion, like this. And this whole part up here gets cracked away. So now when you look at this sample. The sample is like this and you're looking at the inside face of the outer layer of the lipid bilayer. You see? So this is looking at the outside of the inside layer and this is looking at the inside of the outside layer. Okay. That's pretty complicated, but just stay with me for one second. So what they do in this case is they crack off the muscle, but also they crack off the outer layer of the lipid bilayer of this 
nerve terminal. So I'm going to redraw this. So you have something, here's your, your synapse, and you have your synaptic vesicles in here. And of course, normally this is a lipid bilayer, like this. And of course, they have to do the experiment over and over and over again because they have to get it to crack the way they want it to crack, which is in this configuration. They want to look at, at this inner membrane, and so they crack it, and of course the muscle is up here, but this gets cracked off like this, so that what you end up with is the inside of the layer. I mean, here's the outer layer, okay, like this. And if there is a vesicle fusion event, it's, this layer is going to be like this. There's another vesicle, and I'll, I'll draw a third vesicle, like this. So when you crack off this top layer, and you look down at this, what you see are holes. One here, one here, and one here. Now, when they crack this off, like I said, they have to get lucky, but they remove the muscle fiber, and then they remove the outside edge, the outer leaflet of the lipid bilayer, and they expose this underside, and then they spray this top sample here with platinum. They have a little, they call it a gun, but they have some a bar of platinum here, and they apply electricity to it, and it evaporates the metal off and sprays onto the surface of this sample. And then they spray it with carbon, and the carbon offers some strength, like carbon fiber. And then it turns out that they dissolve the sample away, and you end up with a mold of this surface here. So it's just kind of like a little mold, and then there's a little indentation in the mold, and a little indentation. Um, and that's a thin layer of metal in carbon. They call it a replica. And you can use acid, hydrofluoric acid, to dissolve this sample away. So you end up with this piece of metal like this that's a mold of the sample itself. And then you take this sample and you put it on a slide for the electron microscope, which is called a grid, and you look at this sample in the electron microscope. So this process that we just talked about is called freeze fracture. So you freeze the sample somehow, in this case, with Hoiser's fancy freezing machines, but there's other techniques for that type of freezing. And then this uh, gets cracked off by this knife. Now there's one more important aspect of the freezing that I need to mention, and that is that the freezing event happens so quickly when you slam the piece of tissue against the copper block that the water in the sample freezes, that it, is it goes from a liquid to a solid, but it happens so quickly that ice crystal formation doesn't happen because we all know that when water freezes, it expands. And if you had this piece of tissue and you freeze it and then the water expands the piece of tissue, then you destroy all of the structure that you need to visualize in the electron microscope. So once again, the sample freezes, the water in the sample goes from a liquid to a solid, but it doesn't expand because the freezing event happens so quickly that the ice doesn't have time to crystallize. Okay, we're almost there. If you look at figure eight of the paper, they show the top of the nerve terminal. So if I can just redraw this a little bit bigger. Something like this, three vesicles fusing with the membrane. Of course, there are others here. We said that the sample was frozen, and then here's the outer membrane, because 
for this. And we said that the, the outer membrane was torn off here by the freeze fracture technique. And then we said, well, so what actually happens is this gets sprayed with metal. So you make a mold, a metal mold of using platinum. And then there's another spray of carbon to give this sample strength. And then they, they dissolve the tissue away in very strong acid, hydrofluoric acid. And then what you're left with is just this little metal piece that I said was picked up on basically the slide for the electron microscope, the grid. And then you're looking down at the structure in the electron microscope at this replica. And in figure eight, what they show is this um, is is looking down at, at the sample like this and you see these little holes like this okay and those holes are these holes right here it's the opening or the invagination well it's uh it's fusing the fusing event sorry and um, you can see the hole that's being created as the vesicle fuses with the membrane. So they do have another set of beautiful papers, Poiser, Reese, and colleagues, in which they, they show um, nerve terminals like this, so you can see from a sideways view rather than this top-down view, you can see the vesicles actually fusing with the cell membranes in this orientation. But I don't want to review all those papers. I wanted to review this one. I mean, they wrote many beautiful papers on this topic, but I wanted to review this one because I think the technique's really cool, and uh, I love the freeze, the freeze slam machine. Okay, everyone, that's it for today. I know there's a lot to unpack, but I thought you'd enjoy that paper, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.